Hebrews 19, oh, I had it there up in the back. <laughs> Hebrews 19, 10, 19 through 25 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us, hold fast the con let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and as much so the more, and as much and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we're going to be singing Christ Be All Around Me. And I thought this verse was, these verses were appropriate because Jesus is, like, obviously we say Jesus is the reason for the season, yo. Um, but <laughs> um, really, like, G Jesus is the reason for the season because he came. That's why we sing Reckless Love because, like, he came and he, because he loved us. So we're going to be singing Christ Be All Around Us, All Around Me.
you. Good morning. I forgot my cup of water to wet my whistle. How's everybody doing this morning? You sure? Awesome. Well, praise the Lord. Well, I invite you to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, as we continue, scene number two in this drama of Scripture, um, the story of a Redeemer, and this is where things start to turn and become something that we are more familiar with, I would guess if we can say it that way. Why are things the way they are today? Genesis chapter 3 gives us a clear answer as to why. So if you have your copy of the Bible or your gadget, I'm going to read the chapter in its entirety, and then I'll pray and ask God, God's blessing upon our time together. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? And so he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return." And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics or coats of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken so he drove out the man, and he placed a cherubim 
at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the tree, the way to the tree of life. God, as we come before you as a church together, both members and attenders and visitors, it is now we ask that your word that you want us to hear would be heard. That you would give us ears to hear, and eyes to see, and a heart to understand, that we would um, worship you as we hear your word, as we want to worship you and obey you and know you. May you reveal yourself to us from this passage. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, we now come to, as I said, a second scene of this story, this narrative. It's a beautiful poetry. You wouldn't know, right? It's wonderful poetry here. But this is now the next scene. God completed his perfect creation. There was no disorder, no chaos, no conflict, no struggle, no pain, no discord. Nothing would get old, nothing would deteriorate. And best of all, there was no death. Everything that God created, as we looked at last week in Genesis 1 and 2, was good. In fact, God said in verse 31 of chapter 1 that it was very good. And what made God's creation very good was, yes, the things that He created, but what made God's creation very good was that God Himself would dwell with His people and He places them in a beautiful place called the Garden of Eden. The picture that God wants us to get from that is this place of beautiful, perfect harmony between God and His creation. Well, we find ourselves today so far removed from that picture that we see in the Garden of Eden. Today, we see so much pain, so much suffering, and death in the world today. In the beginning, when God created man, God created them to be together with Him in perfect harmony. Today, there is so much pain and suffering. And even now, as we look around and we look at people, we wonder why people act the way they do. Why do people behave the way they do? Why do, why, why do men in their hearts have so much evil dwelling in their hearts? Why do people have hostility and resentment toward God and even toward our fellow men? Why is that the case? That man seems to love evil and does not want anything to do with God for the most part. Why? Well, in Genesis, we have a record of why. In Genesis, we have a record of why things are the way they are today. And I would argue that nothing makes sense. Nothing makes sense that we see today apart from a proper understanding of this book called Genesis. Genesis, I would say, is the most important book of the Bible. For without it, you and I will be left pondering and wondering why are there so many problems in life today? What's going on? Genesis explains for us the condition of the universe and the state of humanity. No other book comes close. No other book comes close. It explains why there are so many problems. It explains the human dilemma. It explains our need of a Savior and it explains why, what I should say, God is doing in history for us to learn. Genesis 3, in particular, gives us a true and an accurate description of the world that we live in today. And it also gives us the necessary foundation for a true and an accurate worldview. Every worldview, I would argue, that lacks this foundation and this understanding is utterly and hopelessly wrong. Utterly and hopelessly wrong. And so we come to Genesis 3 today. The story of the Redeemer and the world that God created is no longer good. Yes, there are traces of God's goodness and God's beauty all around us. But we see so much evil and so much suffering. Something has changed. 
something has gone wrong. And this chapter begins now, as you look at your Bible, you will see a new character is on the scene. His name is the serpent. The author does not give us an explanation as to how or why the serpent is even allowed into this beautiful picture of the Garden of Eden. How and why? Those questions are even asked today. Why did God let sin come into the world? Have anybody ever asked you that question? Why did, let, why did God let sin come into the world? I was asked this, that question this week. Kind of stumped me at first. Maybe it might stump you today. I'm going to give an answer, or probably many ways to answer that question, but I'm going to give an answer to, to that question today. But here we have this new character on the scene who is, for some reason, at this point, Genesis does not tell us he's allowed into the Garden of Eden. Only that we know, it says that the Lord God, uh, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And so we see that God created this serpent. And the serpent is more cunning than any beast that the Lord God had made. And right away, you and I read this story and we're somewhat taken back. There's some bizarre things that are happening here in this chapter. His appearance in the Garden of Eden, that takes us back to some degree. But isn't it kind of strange that the serpent is talking? Hmm. I, I have a dog. I talk to my dog from time to time. <laughs> but he don't talk back to me. If he does, you need to get me a new kind of jacket, right? Maybe you have animals that you talk to your animals, and I'm sure you do. And, uh, if you need counsel this morning about that, if the to animal's talking back to you or you think the animal is talking back to you, make sure you come and see me this morning, all right? But look, you notice something about the scene that we have here? The woman, look at her. Uh, she is not taken back by this whole bizarre scene that you and I are looking at and saying, whoa, how is this serpent talking? Why is this serpent talking? She's not taken back by it at all. In fact, she seems at ease, does she not? She is speaking freely with this serpent. We're not told why, but she's at so much at ease. Perhaps we can only surmise and guess that maybe in the beginning, it would be the perfect world, right? You'd be able to talk to an animal, and the animal would talk back to you. and You would have a, a relationship and be able to talk. You can fix them a lot easier, right? They can tell you what's wrong. What do you want to do? You want to go out? No, you want to get a stick? What do you want to do? You know, it's like you ask the dog a thousand million questions, and the dog keeps on looking at you. His ears are going like this. His head's going like this. And you, you think he gets it, but you're not sure. And only if he can talk back to you, it would be great, would it not? Sometimes we think they really are communicating to us. <laughs> but here the serpent is talking. She's at ease with it. Maybe things were different back then. We don't know. Or this is so soon after the creation of the woman Eve, and everything is so new, it's kind of like a kid in a candy store or a kid in a toy store. It's like going here and going there, and she's finding out all these things about the wonderful Garden of Eden that she's in, and, and you know, she's at ease. This is a wonderful thing. But notice the character of this serpent is it says that the serpent was more cunning, more crafty, shrewd. Interesting word that is used for the serpent. We quickly find out that the serpent is not her friend. He's not a friendly animal that she should be talking to. He's cunning, he's shrewd, he's crafty. And you know, to tell you the truth, it's not necessarily wrong to be cunning, shrewd, and kind of crafty. You understand that, right? Maybe you're wondering where I'm going with that. But did not Jesus say in the Gospels that he wants us to be wise as serpents? and harmless as doves. So there needs to be, a, you know, a wisdom there that God wants us to have. So it's not a bad, but in this case, it is a bad thing. For the serpent is a puppet for God's enemy. The serpent is Satan in disguise. Now, Genesis does not tell us that. You read this whole account, there's no reference to Satan at all, but we just know that this is an enemy of God because this person, this serpent, is Speaking to her, the opposite of what God said to her 
Genesis doesn't tell us where the serpent came from. It doesn't tell us where Satan came from. We would have to look elsewhere for that. We do. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, listen to the word of the Lord. And so the, the great dragon was cast out. The serpent, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's prophecy. That will happen later on. But it's also something that's been fulfilled, in a sense. Because after Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, something happened from that verse to chapter 3, verse 1. That is, that Satan was cast down out of heaven onto the earth to deceive the world. You see, God created the spirit world. As best we can understand, he created the spirit world. All the angels, God created them prior to creating anything material, anything physical that we see with our eyes. He created the spirit world. And we know that when we look in Job chapter 38, verse 7, it says that the morning stars, another reference that's given for angels, are there as God is laying the foundation to the creation as he's having this conversation with Job. So the angels were there. They were already created. And just as creation is created good and for God, so were the angels. But something happened in the angelic world. They rebelled against God and followed one of God's beautiful angels that he created. Not all of them are given names, but three of them are. We have Gabriel, Michael, and another name is given to another angel called Lucifer. And Lucifer was created as a beautiful angel. If you write this down for looking at later on, Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 and following, will give you a, a description of Lucifer's creation, how he was created, what he looked like, what he was doing, what he was made for, most beautiful of all of the angels that God created. And then we look elsewhere to find out what happened to this beautiful angel. And that's found in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 and following. Again, both verses 12 and following. That's interesting, isn't it? You can look at that. Write those down and look at it. And so we have this serpent who's disguised. It's Satan in, in disguise, coming cunningly trying to deceive the woman whom God created. Immediately, the serpent uh, attacks the the. Weaker vessel, the Bible says that the wife is the weaker vessel. Where's Adam? We don't know. It's not there. But he goes after the woman here in the Garden of Eden, and he attacks at the juggler vein. He attacks the point in which God rules. Remember, I told you that God rules through his word. God rules creation through his word, and God rules this way. And Satan says, did God really say has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And God did say that in chapter 2. He said, if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And so he's questioning God's word. Did God really say? God says you will die. Satan says you will not surely die. What is he doing? Well, the same thing he's, he does today. He is bringing confusion. He is bringing doubt in their lives. He, he's causing them to question God's goodness and keeping the tree of the knowledge and good and evil from them. He is directly contradicting God's word. And they're listening and they're trusting his words over God's. Remember again, God rules his creation through his good word. And so Satan is attacking her. Satan attacks the same way he did back here in the Garden of Eden. Did he not come to Jesus when Jesus was at his weakest point? Maybe in a sense feeling abandoned by his father. And Satan comes to Jesus and begins to tempt him in different ways. Turn those rocks into bread. Why isn't your father feeding you? And Jesus comes with the word of God, defeating Satan over and over again. Satan still attacks God's people the same way. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul the Apostle, listen to what he says. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Notice, Paul is not a wacko. Paul's not crazy. Paul doesn't think Genesis is a myth. 
He doesn't think what's happened in the Garden of Eden is just a story. It's a fable. It's made up. You shouldn't believe it. He is looking back at Genesis chapter 3, and he's quoting what happened back there. Just as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds, Christians, today may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, God wants to save all people. God wants all of us to come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. God wants everyone to be in heaven with him. But Satan doesn't. And there's this hostility and there's this war going on, deceiving people's minds into believing lies. People think they're good enough to get to heaven. Where did that come from? That came from Satan. People think they can work their way to heaven. Where did that come from? It came from Satan. Deceiving people. Their minds are being corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Christ is all around us. Christ is all that we need. We sing it. But do we really believe that as believers? Christ is all I need. Next thing we see that Satan is doing, he's making God to be, making God out to be a killjoy. Doesn't, God doesn't want me to be happy. God knows, he says, that if you eat from this tree, you'll be like him. That's what he says to her. Maybe he doesn't really want you to be in his image. He's just saying he's created you in his image. He doesn't really want you to be in his image. He's holding something back from you. And what is the result? What is the result of, of the rebellion that we see here? The result is a complete reversal from all that God wanted to be good for his creation. Everything that God said would happen is going to happen or has happened to his creation. We see sin in the Garden of Eden. We see sin. We see its consequences. They're all defined for us right here in this account in Genesis. And for the rest of this morning, we're going to look at those consequences of what happened in the Garden of Eden. The first thing we see that happens, and this, this affects you and me today. This is why things are the way they are today. The first thing we see is that the order of creation has been subverted. The order of creation has been subverted. God was to rule over his people who were to rule over his creation. But now the serpent exercises control and authority over his people who rejected God. And this affects you and me. Because every person born from what happened to Eden, the same thing that happened to Adam and Eve happened to Cain and Abel, and it happened to their children, and on and on it goes to you and I. There's an authority problem. It's been subverted. God ought to be the authority over everyone's life. But people since this day right here have chosen another authority. And believe it or not, spiritually, most people don't realize this, but every person born from this point on is born under Satan's authority. Jesus alludes to this. In speaking to the religious people in John chapter 8, verse 44, he says, you are of your, of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The order of creation has been subverted. You see, Satan offered knowledge that Adam and Eve felt God was withholding from them. A knowledge, it says, of good and evil. It's not that Adam and Eve did not know good and evil, for they knew it was evil to go and eat from the tree, because God said, if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. They had that knowledge. What kind of knowledge is God keeping from them? Well, it was a good kind of knowledge of good and evil. It was a knowledge of determination that he wanted to refrain from them. God wanted them to trust and obey him and not to determine for themselves what was good and what was evil. He wanted to define that for them. God wanted them to look to him for that determination. God wanted to be 
God wanted to be the definer of what is good and what is evil. And he wanted them to look to him to decide what is good and what is evil. And that's the same thing that is true today. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, God says, trust the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And what? And, and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will what? Direct your path. And instead, we, we are, we're like Adam and Eve. And we want to we direct our own path. We want to be on our own throne. Like Adam and Eve, we want to decide for ourselves what is good and bad. And they wanted to decide for themselves and have their lives. They want to live free from the authority of God. And they went from law keepers to lawmakers. I will define what is evil. I will define what is good. And that is happening in our world today. Goodness and evil, is, not, is it not relative to some people? Isn't this what defines sin, though? This is the definition of sin. When Mark uh, Somer was preaching for me, he defines sin, maybe you remember this, as, a, as stinky inner nastiness. Stinky inner nastiness. That's a good way to define sin. But isn't sin also doubting God's word? Choosing to live our lives without God, in effect, knock God off, this, off of his throne and decide for ourselves, and in turn, we are God ourselves. And there are some serious consequences from Adam and Eve's decision to go against God, and it affects you and me, and it brings sadness into our story. Let me give you three quick things here of what is in this passage of Scripture that affects you and me in a great way. Instead of life, there is death. Instead of life, there is death. Death means separation. And Adam and Eve show that they are separated from God and that they are no longer feeling the same way they felt. Uh, they were naked, it says, and they were unashamed. But now, as they hear God getting closer, the consequences of their sin is now they have a knowledge that they didn't have before. They feel the shame. But disobeying God, and then they go out and provide for themselves, God rejects them and their covering. And listen, the first death comes into the world because of Adam and Eve's decision to go against God. You know where that's found? In verse 21, it says, And also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin, coats of skin, and he clothes them. He doesn't just hand them to them. He clothes them. Where did he get those coats of skin from? Well, it's obvious. He got it from another animal. He got coats of skin, and he brings death into the world because the the punishment for sin is what? Death. And now they're wearing this reminder of what sin brings into the world. Instead of life, there is death. An angel with a flaming sword, and they're driven out of the Garden of Eden. And, and so, that, so that man would not live in a state of separation forever. God forbid them from coming and having access to the tree of life. The tree of life is seen as a symbol of that antidote to aging. Without that antidote, death would surely come to their lives, and it does. Death is now in the world because of Adam and Eve's sin, and it now plagues all of mankind. Death will always be the punishment for sin. So instead of life, we have death. Instead of relationships, there is hostility. Instead of relationships, there is hostility. We, we see this in their response to God. They're no longer trusting God. But now there's a fear. They're hiding from him. We see this hostility in that instead of having a relationship with the Lord who provided for everything they need, they are, they are making that for themselves, fig leaves to cover their nakedness. And they're hiding, trying to cover up their sin. sin. And instead of waiting for God and talking with God and communion with God and having a relationship with him, there is hostility. They are afraid of the Lord God. Uh, one could argue, and rightly so, that this kind of fear of God is not what God wants in our lives. God doesn't want us to fear Him for the wrong that we've done in our life. But it is 
what we should fear. We should fear God when we do wrong. But it's not something that God wanted in the original creation. This kind of fear is wrong. It's a dreadful feeling to have that you've done something wrong and you fear God. There are people, even here this morning, I guarantee you that you have fear in your life because you're living in sin, you've done something wrong, and you fear God, and you rightly should fear God because God is going to judge you. But the wonderful thing is that's what Christmas is all about. God sent the Savior into the world to remove that fear that you, you and I should not have because God doesn't want you to live in that kind of fear. And this hostility is seen from this point on, all throughout the Scriptures, from creation all the way through, man is always hostile toward God. So instead of relationships, there is hostility. Third, instead of blessing, there is a curse. God proceeds to pronounce on each participator judgment. Notice in your Bible, in verse 14, the Lord God cursed the serpent. And then if you look over at verse 17, he curses the ground. Uh, Adam and Eve are not cursed. They're punished for what they've done. And the curse that God puts on the serpent and the curse that God puts on the ground is going to affect them. But there's also some good things that come from this punishment. In verse 16 to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In, in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. There's, there's the sorrow and this pain. It, it indicates that this is not God's original desire, that, that if they were to remain in the Garden of Eden with God as their king, and his kingdom and sin would never come in the world. Every child being born in the world from Eve and then on and on and goes, it would not be in pain. There would not be sorrow in that. But now there is. Things would not go easy for her. And there will be a conflict. And this could have been under this conflict of relationship that will be between the male and the female. You see that there in verse 16. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. There's a conflict in relationship between husband and wife from the sin that came into the world. Her, her desire shall be for a husband. That word desire is repeated again in chapter 4, verse 7, where God says to Cain that sin has a desire to master over you. And this is right here saying that the woman will have a desire to rule over her husband. Interesting that it happens right there in the Garden of Eden. And this hostility, fighting that is going on, her conflict with her husband would end in defeat. And then in verse 17 to the man, he said, Because you have indeed heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, curses the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and Thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the, the herb of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. Hard work. The ground was cursed, and so it would be no longer easy for the man to work. Hard life. Now let's, let's end this with the curse that God put upon the serpent. To the serpent, he says, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat the dust all the days of your life and I will put enmity, hostility between you and the woman and look between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The punishment, the curse that is put upon the serpent is one of humiliation. The consequences for his sin is defeat by the woman's offspring. There's no mercy shown to the serpent. He was instrumental in bringing down the woman and bringing sin into the world. And now the Lord will humiliate him in using the woman toward his ultimate defeat. A promise of blessing comes at the end of the serpent's curse. 
not for him, but for all mankind. Through the seed of a woman, it says, a deliverer would come, a promised savior. Look at that at the end of verse 15. Uh, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Notice it's him. It's he will do this to you. You will bruise his heel. This is the first promise of the Messiah that God gives to the world through the seed of a woman. He, his heel would be bruised. He, he's wounded for our transgressions. Uh, he, he's dealt a blow, but it's not a, an ultimate blow that, that is final for his life. It's just his heel being bitten. And he will, as we know, die, be buried and rise again on the third day and ultimately defeat death. But notice what he says to the serpent. But a blow to Satan would happen to be bruised, or the Hebrew word is his head would be crushed. This speaks of his authority. That which he took away from God is going to be taken back and given back to the Lord and to his people. Paul alludes to this in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, where he says, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Notice those words. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Who is, who is he speaking to there? He's speaking to the church. Every believer. You will ultimately have victory over Satan. You will crush his authority. His authority should not be over your life forever. But one day... As Jesus says that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. Satan will have his ultimate defeat. And God is going to use his people. Hallelujah. Amen. The people of God to crush his head. Now I want to point out one more thing about this blessing. The place of blessing that God gave to them is now taken away. Uh, they were to be blessed forever in the Garden of Eden with God's presence. Forever and ever. This wonderful picture, but God drives them out of the Garden of Eden and the place of blessing was going to be God himself, his presence. And they're driven out of the garden, this wonderful place. God puts an angel, a flaming sword to keep them from returning, as I said earlier. And even though this is a punishment, this is still uh, an act of mercy, an act of grace, because God doesn't want them to live in that state forever, but offer them hope and forgiveness for what is plague in the world called death. And so this driving out, this drama in the Scriptures, brothers and sisters, please see this. It doesn't end here. It continues. It, you see it even in Genesis 4 as Cain and Abel. They're not born inside the Garden of Eden, in the presence of God, but they're born outside the Garden of Eden, away from the presence of God. And then Cain rises up and he kills Abel. And then God drives Cain further away, it says, from the presence of the Lord east of Eden. All of this is symbolic nature, that the place of blessing that they're being driven from is being driven from the very presence of God Almighty. You see, God's original plan, it's not defeated, but his plan was for this wonderful place of harmony, that mankind can be with him forever and ever. And so God makes a promise to send a Savior into the world who will be born of the seed of the woman. He would bruise, he would be bruised, and he would crush the head of the serpent. And so this is God's promise. The world awaits for this to come true. But don't doubt this for a, for a second, that Satan is watching from this point on. What's going to happen? I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And so that's why it's called a drama. Satan is watching how all of this unfolds. Who is this he going to be that's going to crush my head? And so he works in Cain. Cain kills Abel. He, he works during the people, the days of Noah, because God gave Adam and Eve another child called Seth, and from Seth came Noah. And then during the days of Noah, the people turned against God again. Hostility. Resentment toward God. And then the Tower of Babel, the same thing. This drama goes on and on and on. And as we'll see next Sunday, God is going to continue this story in, in the person of Abraham. 
The story of the Redeemer moves on. It's really a drama, a cosmic battle between the enemy, Satan, and the Lord God, his people. And so I began this morning's message with saying this. Why did God allow such a beautiful thing that he created to be over? Why did he let sin into the world? Why did he let evil into the world? Well, there's many ways I can answer this question for you, but I'm going to just tickle your mind for this answer. A short answer is this. And it's a wonderful way to answer the end, end this message. There are things about God's character that you and I would never know, never understand, that are true about God. You see, there's only one God, right? And, and God, is, God is who he is. But there's certain things about God that you and I would never know if he didn't let evil and sin come into the world. You would never know it. For instance, uh, a negative thing, God's wrath. We don't want to know that, right? But God's wrath is in the world, and people rightfully fear God because God allowed sin and evil into the world. It's negative. But there... Watch, do that again. <laughs> but there's something positive here. Uh, God's mercy and God's grace would never, ever be known by anybody. Sin deserves punishment, but God reveals his mercy and his grace to us because evil and sin are in the world. And think about this. Would people really love God? Would people really love God without experiencing his forgiveness? Consider what God's love would look like if sin never came into the world. God would be, in a sense, loving people who are in some sense perfect. That'd be easy to love, wouldn't it? But put this love against the backdrop of sin and evil and wickedness. Is God's love not so much greater? And so those who are skeptical and thinking through these things, this is a pretty good answer, I thought. I was pretty impressed with myself. I want to end with this thought. Do you realize that for all eternity... All those who have experienced God's love through the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ and dying on a cross for all eternity, only those who have experienced God's love through the Lord Jesus Christ for all eternity, you are with all your heart, and you're going to mean this. You can't help it. You're going to be singing hallelujah, praise the Lord. You are going to love God so much more and so much greater because he forgave you of all of your sins. Amen? And think about our sins are so great. And he forgives us. If you're here this morning and you don't know the forgiveness of God that is found in Jesus Christ, if you've never turned from your sins and put your trust in Jesus, would you do that this morning? You will experience the love of God like you've never experienced before in your life. God's love is so much greater when you understand your sin and your need for God's forgiveness. Would you bow your heads and let us pray together? Let every head bowed and every eye closed. I wonder how many here this morning who were encouraged by what they heard, experienced God's, God's love in a way maybe you've never experienced before, understanding God's love. Maybe there's someone here this morning who, who has never really turned from their sin and put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know about God. You know about Jesus but you've never trusted him to be your savior. You are on the throne of your heart. You decide what is good and bad life. You're the king of your own domain. That's not the way God created you. You need to turn from that and put your trust in Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Now this will be the best Christmas of your life.
to experience the Savior that has come into the world. To be born in a manger, to be born to become a man, and to die for your sins. May that become true in your life today. And for all of us, would you love God so much more? Would you see him for what he's done for you? Would you worship him? God, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Bless us now as we respond to you in faith from our hearts of worship as we sing unto you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we all stand together and uh, sing to the Lord in response to what he's done for us. If you need prayer or counsel, need someone to talk to this morning, uh, slide out of your pew, come over and grab my hand, and we'll get you to a room to talk to one of our counselors to help you out this morning. May God be glorified. Traveled from